I saw you, but I didn't register, really. I'm disappointed that you took the bus instead of sailing down. You can sit over there. Yeah. Great. Oh, well, I, can, I can scoot over one. Yeah, Christy, I don't know where she's going to... Oh, just got her stuff here. Somebody else is sitting here? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can just, like, grab a chair over there. Yeah, grab a chair. chair This is awesome. I've never been in a panel where I'm like, three feet away from the front row. I prefer to be exposed. Hi, everybody. Is that a normal thing to say? I prefer to be exposed. Chris, audio is good? Oh, wait. What do you Have the seat. <laughs> no, you you have the open mic seat. Yeah, I know. I feel like I feel guitar. like I should be wearing a black turtleneck and jeans. <laughs> One more thing. I mean, I would say Natty Light plus open mic night. Yeah. Like, I'm going all the way back to 2003 in my timeline. Yeah, we should be in the Nurarican uh, Poets Cafe right now. <laughs> That's okay, Rayhan's way later than everybody. <laughs> yes, uh, everyone should uh, go on Twitter and uh, troll Rayhan right now for not being here. <laughs> it's at R-E-I-H-A-N. Uh, I encourage all of this. All right, my name is Ashok Chandra. I'm with America's Future Foundation. We're a 501c3 that puts on events uh, more or less quarterly. Uh, we try to get young professionals together to learn about topics they may or may not know about. Obviously, today is software patents. This is a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart because I'm a former patent attorney. And uh, I've gone both ways on this. Sometimes when I've dealt with clients, I think this is the dumbest idea I've ever had. No one should ever have a patent on this. For example, a belt buckle with a bottle opener. <laughs> and at other times, a pharmaceutical patent. It does actually help uh, for the constitutional notion of uh, progress of the useful arts. Uh, we have an, a fantastic panel here today, and they're all going to be talking about uh, their notions on software patents and patents in general. And so uh, please uh, hold your questions till the end. Or And Chris Gunn, my good friend, is going to be moderating. Also, I need to let you know that we have a swill bucket back there. So whenever you're done with uh, your beer, just uh, toss the beer in before you throw it in the trash can. <laughs> I'm passing around a sign-up sheet. If you're interested in coming to more America's Future Foundation events, uh, please sign up. Our last event was about the gold standard, and we had this fantastic debate between uh, Joe Weisenthal, Josh Barrow, and Andrew Schiff. Uh, you might know Joe Weisenthal and Josh Barrow as the people who wanted to mint the coin, the trillion dollar coin, <laughs> and Andrew Schiff as a gold bug who uh, wants to go back to the gold standard. So all our debates are fantastic. <laughs> so hope, I'm sure this will be fantastic also. So I'll turn this over to Guan. You want to talk about Hack Manhattan? Uh, Crystal? Okay. okay. 
Hey, we don't have our banner on the wall, but this is us. Hi, uh, we're hosting you tonight. Thank you for coming to our free alcohol event. Uh, if anybody's interested in seeing our space, it's just downstairs in 201. We're a community-based hacker space. We've got lots of tools for electronics, and we've got a machine shop. Uh, we have a membership that comes in and works on all kinds of different interesting projects, 3D printing, and Arduino, and things like that. And um, you're welcome to take a look at what we do if you want to stop by on your way out or take a break and run downstairs. And we're very excited that you all should come out for this tonight. It's a, it's a great program. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. Before, if uh, you're on your phones and you're on Twitter, uh, if you talk about what's going on here, please hashtag it AFF Paddings. So because at, people at, love when people do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the speakers, uh, Twitter should be in front of them. OK, go ahead. Um, oh, OK. Now we're on the um, Hello, I'm Chris Gawne. I'm your moderator. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, my microphone. I haven't, uh, we're not here to hear me speak, so I'll, I'll be very short. I work for a place called uh, Gartner. Uh, we're a research and consulting firm uh, for IT. And I was asked by Ashok to moderate this, you know, wonderful panel. I mean, seriously, I sent out emails. This is the first draft picks right here. Uh, really great. Way smarter than I am. So, uh, you know, we'll get really great information. Um, so, AFF, uh, Hackspace, um, also t Tim Lee, thanks, uh, from ours. And why is there feedback? Can you turn those off? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, for the people uh, streaming, I do. So, and I just look really cool with this. <laughs> um, and I want to drop it later. Be like, boosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, we're not here to hear me speak. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, t Tim Lee from ours, he helped, he helped uh, set up the panel. Uh, also, uh, he's a Forbes writer. Um, and also, I was going to, Guan asked me to uh, mention an event on Saturday, um, Aaron Schwartz's uh, uh, memorial service at um, Cooper Union. Uh, you could go to Eventbrite. Uh, s you know, some people, some of us were friends with them, um, so uh, you could sign up for tickets there. Uh, it was very sad. Uh, so on a more serious note, <laughs> or l less serious note, uh, let me introduce the topic. Uh, we're here to talk about software patents. Um, the patent system has been a long, around for a very long time. It's enshrined in our constitution. Uh, you know, Shook talked a little bit about sort of the patent, uh, the, po the poster ch child of the patent system, which is drug companies. Uh, here, research is so expensive. You have to spend many years doing it. And you only get one pill. The second pill costs basically nothing to make, uh, and you could replicate the process um, once it's out in public, and you know how exactly to do that. To um, sort of encourage research in, in different areas, we set up a patent system uh, throughout history where we grant a limited time monopoly, usually, I mean the, oh, that's probably Rehan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we grant a limited time monopoly. I mean, we have lawyers that are better experts than obviously I am. And you um, make the information public on how you actually you know, engineered uh, th the thing that you're going to patent. And uh, you know, during a limited amount of time, we'll give you a, gra a government granted monopoly. Uh, so, in recent times, uh, since at least the early 70s, the U.S. Patent Office, and we have people from the U.S. Patent Office here, have been giving out uh, software patents. And in even less, in more recent times, and over the past probably 10 or 20 years, um, it has been a huge debate on if these, if software should be patentable. That's number one. Uh, is the current system correct, and does it? Um, does it encourage, uh, you know, development and innovation in this field? So that's my spiel. I mean, most people are here to see the panel, except for my brother who's here to see me because he's <laughs> never saw me in a suit before. <laughs> so, uh, so I was going to introduce all of you, but uh, I think it's better if you just introduce yourselves and then give a 
you know, a five minute spiel on, you know, what your position is on software patents and uh, if you think the system that is curr currently exists uh, should remain the same or should be reformed in some way. Uh, so we could actually start with Alan, if you want to. Okay. <laughs> well, it's nice to see such a good collection, a large collection of people interested in talking about patents. I can't say I would ever expect to see that during my career, but uh, it is a nice thing. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Alan Tenenbaum. I'm a partner in the law firm of Tenenbaum, Halpern, Syracuse, and Hurstritt. Um, I'm a patent attorney and trial lawyer. I've been uh, doing patent work now for about 25 years. Um, I started my uh, career as an examiner in the patent office while I was attending law school. Um, undergraduate, I have an engineering background, uh, and then went on to law school. So uh, I worked at the patent office and learned <clears throat> all about patent uh, procurement during law school, and I've stuck with the field uh, since. So um, I do uh, all different kinds of patent work, procurement of rights for people, uh, litigation enforcement, both for patent owners and the defensive side, uh, licensing deals involving um, patented and other technology, uh, and also evaluating rights in connection with uh, financial transactions, venture capital investments, acquisitions, et cetera. Um, uh, in my view, if you probably didn't already figure it out, uh, software patents are a good thing. They're a real good thing. Um, like patents for uh, other things. They are uh, the, the driver of our economy. They are the, uh, the thing that enables you to capitalize on your hard work and your investment. They are the, uh, the piece of property that enable you to go out and get funding for your work. Um, they enable you to build a business around it, sell your business to somebody else, or license the technology to others. Uh, it also encourages innovation uh, by disclosing the technology to, uh, to other people. I think they're a good thing. Um, there are some problems with our system, and I'm certainly not opposed to uh, making changes and tweaks to uh, the system to address some of the uh, ongoing problems um, with the system. But uh, overall, I think uh, software patents are a, a plus for our economy, um, and uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of them. So that's my, uh, my background and my position. Christine? Are we going in order this way? Yeah, yeah. You can go right. down to that way. I think uh, perfectly set up for that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Christina hey. Mulligan. And right now I'm a, should I talk into this? Or how? Yeah. Hello? Uh, there's no speaker. It's okay. Just, uh, um, I'm a postdoc and a lecturer at Yale Law School right now. Um, and I want to frame this discussion in terms of sort of the canonical example of why we sort of might think that software patents are a problem. And that's when you have. Uh, could be a large company, could be a small company um, that is making some sort of software product and they get a demand letter saying we think you've infringed our patent, you should pay us money uh, or are sued for patent infringement. Uh, usually for a patent that they did not copy intentionally and didn't know about. Uh, so usually in this case people then have face a lot of financial difficulties. Uh, the American IP Law Association in 2005 estimated that just getting a letter from a lawyer explaining whether they thought that you infringed the patent, like your own lawyer, uh, at specifying whether they thought that you infringed the patent and whether the patent was valid costed on average like $24,000. James Besson and Michael Moyer at Boston University think that litigating a patent lawsuit um, to sort of a, a, substant a uh, merits judgment to the uh, cost between half a million and four million dollars. So even if you're, you know, you're pretty sure this patent is bogus, you didn't infringe, or you think you didn't infringe, you're suddenly potentially liable for a lot of uh, financial, uh, you, you're suddenly in a really bad financial position. Uh, and usually this situation uh, sparks people to say, well, you know, we do need to make some tweaks to the patent system, maybe. Uh, some, a lot of patents are invalid, are found invalid by courts, about 50% that are litigated for validity, which is sort of a biased sample because you're asking the question in the first place. Um, and claim construction, like what does this patent cover, um, notoriously uh, unclear. Appellate courts overturn the district court's decisions on that very, very, very often. Um, so people say, we need better patents, we need more valid patents, we need patents with clearer claims. But you know, the, while all well and good, this really, uh, bypasses the big problem with software patents. And that's that when you're in that position of trying to decide what, uh, of making some sort of product, you cannot know what patents you might be infringing. Sure, you might be able to find some of them, but you definitely can't mathematically find all of them. And this fundamental unfairness is what really drives the problem with the software patent system, because you can't anticipate what you might be liable for, what you might um, need to license, or you know even 
say, you know, I'm going to make a re you know reasonable risk assessment that this patent's probably invalid, so I'm going to I'm going to infringe it anyway. Uh, and this is because it is basically mathematically impossible to figure out what patents you might be infringing, or at least to get a full list. So what do I mean by mathematically impossible? Um, when let's think about what you would do if you wanted to avoid infringing uh, a. So, like, any software patents. You're making some sort of software product and you want to avoid infringement. First, you need to think about what you, what things that you are writing might be potentially infringing. Now, this is really hard because software patents can be very short, or rather, uh, code infringing software patents can be very short. A sort of fringe case, admittedly, is um, the patent on uh, raising a pop-up window when you try to leave a web page. That can be infringed in three lines of JavaScript, but uh, computer programs are often millions of lines of code. In 1995, Microsoft Word was two million lines. So you somehow, you or your lawyer would somehow need to get in your mind all of the things that your patent might, that your program might be infringing, and then just find some way to narrow down all the software patents that exist and figure out which of those you might be infringing with all the things that you've somehow managed to get in your mind at the same time, which first of all I think is impossible. Um, so you can't read all of the software patents. About 40,000 are granted a year by one estimation. Um, so you would need to kind of narrow this down in some way with, with keyword searches or something like that. But those are those are necessarily going to be either over and under inclusive. Under inclusive, not okay because the patents you do find are not going to um, save you from the patents you don't find. And over-inclusive lists are just going to get you back to that 40,000 patents a year problem. You can't read them all no matter what. Um, and so this really puts software, um, sorry, this really, yeah, this really puts software writers in between a rock and a hard place and in an impossible position. It's like saying, you know, we all agree trespassing is bad, so I'm going to blindfold you and make you take a walk and you can't trespass on anything. And this is just a fundamentally unfair situation to put people in. So it's not about sort of what patentees deserve or property rights or whether by some utilitarian estimation this is incentivizing things. The fact is that the way that software patents currently exist and the patent system currently exists, and this is for many different industries, not just software, notably not chemicals because it's very easy to find um, chemical patents or whether what your molecule is. <laughs> Let me finish. <laughs> that we're debating. <laughs> notably not for chemical patents because it's very easy to find out whether what you've done is potentially infringing a chemical patent because you can order uh, chemical patents by molecule or you can look up chemicals by molecule and see if they're patented. Um, you know, the, the system requires more, I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> There's a, you know, you can't be morally responsible for something impossible and you shouldn't be legally responsible for something impossible. So, what's the, what should we do about software patents? Three possibilities. One, allow for an independent invention defense. If you really did it all by yourself and you didn't copy someone, no liability. Second possibility is infringement just isn't extremely uh, isn't an extremely expensive proposition, a reasonable royalty that's fairly low. Third possibility would be getting rid of um, software patents or at least limiting the number of them. Three sub possibilities there. One is getting rid of very broad functional claims in software patents. If you're a patent attorney, you know what that is, but don't worry about it if you're not. Um, second would be getting rid of sort of pure algorithm patents, which would be fairly easy to excise in terms of distinguishing one from the other. Abstract ideas, you can get rid of them fairly easily using current law. Um, third, which you couldn't do during with current law, is to just get rid of the um, types of patents that are very, very hard to find um, so that people aren't in this impossible position. So there you go. Okay, uh, we'll take <laughs> questions from the audience at the end. I, I want to give each one of the panelists the time to speak. Uh, and Alan already <laughs> wants to get the rebuttal. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, I mean, you got, I'm sorry for all of you. <laughs> that's, uh, and yeah, that's really tough. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, we all share sympathy together. So, uh, Christopher Mims, uh, who I am making take the devil's advocate position. I needed a generalist to, to will defend patents, so. So I'm, a, I, I'm the least qualified person on this panel. <laughs> I am merely an observer, I'm a journalist. Uh, so I might be good at convincing you of things that you should later fact check. And um, uh, so I went into this uh, fairly naive and, you know, as I always do, I just started researching and interviewing people. And some of those folks are here tonight, which I'm grateful for because they can maybe help clarify some things in the Q&A. But 
I wanted to take just a little, a slightly more holistic position, which is that if we take uh, software patents in their historical context, so the debate that we're having tonight, it might feel unique, it might feel like software is, is a unique proposition, but you know, historically we've always had this debate about the software, I mean, sorry, about the patent system. And you know, like when microchips came about, everybody was like, this is insane, you cannot uh, patent hardware. No one today would, would question that, you know, that you could patent you know, the various ways that you build a, a microchip or the, or the layout of the circuits. Um, but that was a debate that was had, you know, like back in the day in the 80s. Um, so, uh, but I thought you brought up a lot of very legitimate issues and, and there definitely is a huge burden that programmers are having to deal with. And so um, I think that it's pretty hard to defend the position that, that the system is totally okay as it is. Um, but uh, the question to ask is, you know, like, is the patent system broken or, you know, is there some other way to change the, the totality of the system so that we, we reach our aim, which is to maximize the amount of innovation that we're producing, right? Like the law is always um, empirical. Like we, we try things out, they don't work, we change the law and, you know, we see if we can do something else. Um, so, so, you know, like some of the proposals that I found interesting were, you know, beyond reforming like the patent and trademark office, you know, what if we uh, reformed like the, the legal system that allows people to engage in this kind of asymmetric warfare, which is true like throughout the legal system, which is that, like, you know, I can file a, a, a patent suit for I don't know how much, tens of thousands of dollars, and it will take you 10 times as much money to defend it. So if you're a small business, you'd rather pay me a license fee. So, I mean, clearly that's what enables this like patent trolling behavior where people just like aggregate a bunch of patents, they don't produce anything themselves, so they can't be attacked by other patent trolls uh, or by legitimate businesses. And then they're just gonna go, you know, kind of enact their tax and innovation. But, you know, if we think about, you know, what are we actually talking about? Because I think there's a lot of people who have kind of like an ideological reaction, like let's just get rid of patents. Um, I mean, that, the, I, I think the implications of that are, are kind of completely unpredictable, right? Like, a lot of people, I think, believe that, that it would lead to this utopia. But I don't, I don't, uh, I, mean, I mean, the bottom line is you can't actually predict what would happen. So we're already getting into this kind of incremental change. So I don't remember the name of it, but in 2011, we passed this Patent Reform Act. And, um, you know, it had two provisions that were relevant and interesting. And one was that, you know, if you're suing people, uh, over patents, you can't name uh, multiple people that you're suing, whatever the legal term Defendants. for that is. Defendants. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been watching a lot of enough court TV lately. So, so like that's a patent. That's a classic patent troll behavior, and it's obviously ex exploitative of the system. So like you know, I have a patent on some really broad thing, and I'm just gonna every big tech company in the world. I'm gonna name them all, and some of them are gonna settle and jackpot for me. You can't do that anymore. Another thing that it did was it uh, it uh, expanded the definition of, of prior art. So so the main uh, one of the main objections to software patents is that that um, people are patenting stuff that's pretty obvious. You know, if it's just the very next step, you know, like hundreds of people everywhere in the world are thinking of that at the same time, and and whether or not it's defensible that one of them can patent it first. Um, that just doesn't seem very friendly to innovation. If we all have to think like, Did I, oh, I just got an idea. Uh, crap, am I the first to patent it? So um, those two things by themselves could have you know, significant effects on our, on our patent system. And, and there are other ways that we might think about reforming our, our legal system. I mean, I'm naive about this, so maybe this is way harder than just doing away with all patents. But like, you know, what if we had special, you know, all patent disputes go to some kind of arbitration, you know? So like we cut out the you know like four hundred dollar an hour lawyers or whatever. They make this so expensive. No lawyers, it would just be much easier. It would be so much easier, as Shakespeare said. So we have instead we have like sixty dollar an hour mediators. Or we could or we could I mean like the UK has a loser pay system for libel lawsuits, right? So if I sue one of you for defamation, uh, you could end up paying my legal fees. I mean, if they can do that, why can't we have that kind of system for patents? You know, I mean, I think that would really 
put the screws on right away. I mean, US, when we don't have to change our patent system at all, just a legal change. I'm just going to ask one of the lawyers. In the U.S., we don't have the U.K. system where you pay for the entire case, but you do pay for some of the expenses, you right? Have to fight, right? Yeah. yeah. You pay for costs. But, yeah. Uh, in some cases, it's very rare, but in some cases, you can get attorney's fees as a plaintiff uh, patent holder if you mm -hmm. win your case. So but, the final, the final point. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, then you can. All right, let's go to Greg. Oh, the lawyers are like okay. ready to fight this one out. Uh, wait, no, we'll go right. Okay, okay, okay. All right, uh, Greg. Uh, hi, my name is Greg Maskell. Um, I'm an associate at Clinton Manual. I've been practicing for about six years. Um, and I've been working in, you know, some, some big cases in sort of the smartphone wars. Um, <coughs> my firm, <coughs> in general, uh, represents Android and a number of um, uh, manufacturers and Google and so forth. And so I've, I've sort of seen in a very upfront and personal way the way litigation often works in the software patent system. And I, th I think the, you know, first of all, I'll, I'll back up. There's sort of four big things that every patent has to uh, uh, satisfy. One is patentable subject matter. So when people say that software patents simply shouldn't be patents, they're saying, okay, it just shouldn't be the subject matter of a patent. Another way you can invalidate is something called anticipation. And anticipation does, says that something in the prior art, so something that somebody already did, they did everything that you put in your claim. And when I say everything, you know, it's literally everything. Every single word in a, in a patent claim has a specific meaning and is supposed to be, uh, you know, you're supposed to construe it and you're supposed to know exactly what it means. The third, the third requirement is something called obviousness. And that's really where you get into trouble because in, in, in many ways, that's what's supposed to invalidate a lot of patents. It's supposed to be obvious. It, that th is the real hammer on bad patents because you don't want just a situation where somebody gets rights for 20 years when all they did was add one little bell to somebody else's work. You want it to be something meaningful. The problem is, is that I think a lot of times lawyers don't even know what the word obvious <laughs> means. And it's next to impossible for a jury to put themselves in, the, they literally, the, the law requires that they are supposed to put themselves in the shoes of what's called a person of ordinary skill in the art. So sort of imagine that you're gonna have, you know, think of a parent or, or a, a son or daughter who has never worked in the computer industry and they are supposed to imagine what it would be like for somebody who has a, say, a bachelor's degree in computer science, whether or not something is obvious. And it's very hard, even for good judges, smart people, to understand what does that really mean. And, you know, I think that the biggest thing is that judges need to, to take control of proceedings. And they have to, there are ways, there are certain procedural tools that they can throw out lawsuits at an earlier stage than going all the way to trial. <coughs> and I think even judges are frequently um, intimidated by complex technology, even, even if that person of ordinary skill in the art would look at it and say, yeah, that's really dumb. <laughs> I can't think of anything that did this exactly, but yeah, that I would know how to do that if somebody went to me at the date that the patent was created and said, go do this, I'd do it. Because in theory, you're supposed to know everything that's in the art. You're supposed to sort of have the infinite wisdom of everything that's in the art. Again, that's very hard for a juror to understand what does that really mean, especially when they get up in, in court and what happens? You have one expert for the plaintiff and you have one expert for the defendant and they're both PhDs they're both professors of some, you know, highly regarded university. And what are they going to do? Um, you know, sometimes they make logical decisions, but 
uh, oftentimes they don't because they're human and they don't really have the background to understand it. So, you know, I think, um, I think there are a lot of problems. Now, what are, what are some of my solutions? Um, you know, for one thing, I think that special masters should be used much more frequently. And what is a special master? A special master is essentially a court appointed expert who comes in and gives the, the, the judge advice as to how you're going to deal with a particular patent. And, you know, my firm had a real, you know, quite frankly, had, had a real problem <laughs> with this when they, when they did a recent case. And the special master had an opinion. And, you know, the judge, um, it, it can be very difficult for the parties because they want to control everything. But I think that the, there, is a, there is something being lost when it's only the parties involved um, saying, OK, let's go for the maximum here. And then the other party is saying, let's go for the maximum in the opposite direction. I don't think that it, you know, justice is served by that. So, you know, I think, I think there are a lot of ways that litigation could be improved, but I don't think that there's, there's anything necessarily wrong with the, the conceptual underpinnings of the system or that software patents should be gotten rid of altogether. Is it in chat? Yeah, you're the moderator. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Neelai. Um, so I'm the managing editor of a site called The Verge. Um, I'm a recovered former attorney. <laughs> Feels great. Uh, six years and going strong. Uh, <laughs> haven't practiced once. Uh, <laughs> so I write a lot about patents and patent lawsuits. Uh, I covered the Apple versus Samsung trial, which Quinn Emanuel was defending Samsung. Got rocked. Uh, <laughs> suck, sucks for you. Uh, so I want to take a very, and I was told like, I'm allowed to be the wild card, so I'm neither... <laughs> I'm neither pro or against, so uh, I will take the joker position of everyone is wrong. Uh, no, I want to talk about something very high level here. Um, and we've been very deep in the weeds of the patent system and how it works. But my contention is that the patent system is actually a massive public policy problem uh, at a very high level because the people I write for and my competitors who write about patents have no idea how this works. They have no idea what the shit you just said. <laughs> Zero. Um, and there's, there's, there's two reasons for it, and I see it all the time. Who do you write for? I write for The Verge. No, no, no. Oh, the, who's, oh, the, your, who's your audience? The uh, yeah. When I think of who I write for, I think of myself at 15, right? Myself at 15 in Racine, Wisconsin, reading Wired magazine and thinking that I'm going to invent the future. And I hope those people are my readers, and I try to inspire them all the time. I fail constantly, but I try. Um, there's two problems here. One is that the patents are not the technology, right? So Apple invents slide unlock. It's a great piece of technology. There's some code. There's some ideas, maybe even an algorithm, although with slide unlock, I'm pretty sure there isn't. Um, and then there's a patent, right? And these things are vastly different from each other. And so Android can implement slide unlock or scroll unlock or some other bullshit, whatever it does. Uh, and it has nothing to do with this piece of paper that says Apple can, has the right to exclude you from using this technology. This piece of paper is a completely abstract idea. So we talk about, oh, we sold or licensed 1,000 patents, or Nortel blows up and they sell all these LTE patents to this consortium called, literally called Rockstar, which I can't, the idea of a consortium of companies called Rockstar buying a billion dollars worth of patents from Nortel, like that is just the most like a bunch of dudes on a golf course <laughs> being like, what should our fucking consortium be called, right? <laughs> And that has nothing to do with the actual technology. Like, literally nothing. That is moving money around and rent-seeking at the most base level. So that is a problem. And when my readers see that, all they think about, all they think about is that the system is corrupt. And they shouldn't trust the system. And that innovation at some level is being taxed. And when they think that, they think to themselves, I will not get a patent. When I am smart, when I grow up, I will invent something amazing and I will not get a patent. I will give it to the world. And what they are saying when they think that to themselves is, I will be poor. <laughs> and that sucks. Like that is the worst thing for them to think, right? Is I will think of something amazing. I will give my talent to the world and I will choose because I believe this system is corrupt. I will choose against taking any profit from it given the constraints of the system that exists. So that's the first problem. And I, I would submit to you that that is the most massive public policy problem facing the patent system today, is that the people who need it the most 
are the people who do not believe in it. And that's terrible. Like, I, frankly, that's terrible. And like, I can't write about the patent system in a way that's convincing to people that they should grow up and seek patents because it's bullshit. Like, there's a lot of bullshit there. The second part, and I try, and they all yell at me, and I get all kinds of amazing hate mail. Uh, <laughs> because it is, like, I mean, that's just silly, right? Like, should slide to unlock be a patent? No, right? It's like, no, but it is, and they think it's corrupt. They think the entire system is corrupt. Now, the second question is, should Apple have won its lawsuit against Samsung? Because Samsung clearly, and I'm sorry, clearly. <laughs> I did not work on this. Clearly, <laughs> but clearly copied the iPhone, right? Like, you look at the products, you look at the dock. It's hundreds of hundreds of pages of, that's the iPhone, our phone doesn't look like it, change X to make our phone. Yes, right, they should have won. So there's somewhere in the middle you've got to find where it's not brazenly corrupt, it's not completely abstracted from the real technology, the real products, but it still allows people to protect their inventions. I don't know the answer to that question. I think there are much smarter people here who might. The, and I think that the second problem, and this is actually a question, I think, for our, our real lawyers. I just, I just play one on the internet. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the hell a software patent is. When I read patents, and they're software patents, they often have hardware claims in them. They're often defined in terms of, and literally, they're like magic words to get you out of being a software patent. It's, it's a hardware system containing a memory chip and a processor, and it's like, now you're not a software patent, you can do whatever the hell you want. And that's lame, right? We don't have the semantic definitions to understand this is one thing that we want to regulate differently from this other set of things. And you talked about pharma patents. Right, you can search pharma patents by molecule. You can search them by structure and effect. And you can say, okay, we're gonna tightly regulate this industry and how they generate patents. The software industry, and to, you know, Silicon Valley is very good at this, they say, don't slow us down. Don't regulate us. Don't tell us what to do. We'll just figure it the fuck out. And then they're like, they write tens of thousands of patents without any ordering, without any system, without any even top line regulation. And now you've got all these submarine patents and you have, you literally, the phrase, we should regulate software patents, or we should ban software patents, is the most meaningless phrase in terms of like technology advocacy, because it means nothing to the actual patents that exist. So again, wild card, I'm sorry that I yelled at everyone. That's an important question, and I can answer it very quickly. Sure. Not to cut the I'm chase probably going to disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome that. I welcome that. But there is no category of patents called software patents. It's not in the statute. Right. A software patent has to be written so that it complies with, conforms to the four categories of inventions that can be patented. They are processes, machines, manufacturers, which some people refer to as an article of manufacture, or a composition of matter, which is like a chemical composition. There's also a clause on the end that says, and new and useful improvements thereof. <laughs> um, but so, so software patents are really just patents that fall within one of those other categories. So typically, you find a software idea, invention, written in the form of a process for doing something. That's like steps, a method of doing something. Or written as a machine, a system comprising and a bunch of different uh, but elements. So, uh, but, no, so I, I think the canonical da answer that I think you kind of want is something that is data processing. It takes in, it gathers some yeah. data, manipulates things, multiplies stuff, divides stuff, and then you get other numbers out at the end. And there's, you can have mixed things where it does that, and then because of the number, then a machine moves, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of a mixed thing, and that has generally been considered a patentable thing. I think, though, when you're talking about machine that does that, you reveal something important about the history of software patents, which is originally they were considered like this is an algorithm. This is just an unpatentable idea. These are just steps that you can do in your brain if you really had a really strong brain. Um, unpatentable. Yeah. And so then people started to redraft the claims to be um, doing the following things on a machine, which it turned out was basically a general computer, but it was they recast them as machine claims to be like, no, it's not an <coughs> abstract thought thing that you so could just can I do. Clarify what you're saying? Yeah. Because it's actually an insane idea. Yeah. What she's describing is the idea that by using magic words in a patent claim, you turn a general purpose computer into a specialized machine. So you're like, here's a patent, literally the slide to unlock patent has this in there. Yeah. Literally, a slide to unlock patent turns an iPhone into a specialized machine that slides to unlock, which is insane. Like, no human being should look at that, especially in the patent office, and say, yeah, that's right. But they do, all because that's literally the, the I mean, that's just the structural so, so example. Here's, so, so here's the question back to you. Slide yeah. to lock. Somebody comes up with the idea. It's a way to unlock your phone. Can, it, any, can anybody use it? 
you know what? It had already been done. They called it activate the function, so Apple didn't know about it. Because you can't search these things because well, people can different. call stuff whatever you want. No, but that's important too. Wait, wait, wait. That's a different question. Here's the, here's the first question. The first okay. question is if somebody created that idea, should they able to be able to claim it as their property? Second question is whether it's patentable, whether it's been done before. Okay, two different questions. And they're both important questions, I think. Well, so, yeah. let's give uh, our last panelist time to speak. Has everyone else spoken? Yeah, everybody else spoken. Oh, that's terrible. I, I'm so sorry and that now I... now I feel like Stephen Colbert. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to hear what you had to say, Christina. That's okay. <laughs> I, I honestly don't have that much to add. Uh, I think of it, I guess, I, I have a kind of very crude mental model. Uh, and my crude mental model is all about, um, you know, kind of how do you lead, how do you kind of give rise, how do you create a fertile environment for, you know, kind of ideas to spread and for people to have more constructive, productive economic interaction. So, for example, you know, why do we think, why are cities unusually productive? And one reason is that, you know, cities allow you to speed up economic interaction because people get to be closer to one another. The time cost of that kind of interaction is slower. That's why cities are unusually productive. And so in a similar vein, I kind of think a lot about, well, why would we create these kind of roadblocks? Uh, because when we think about innovation, I think there's a, you know, there's a, a, a reigning mental model in which upstream innovations are the valuable innovations, uh, patentable uh, ideas, uh, or you know, this kind of basic R&D, that kind of thing. Whereas I, I tend to think that you know, when you look at different econo uh, economies, the economies that are most likely to flourish are those that have the greatest absorptive capacity uh, for innovation, uh, the, the economies in which innovations kind of spread fastest. Um, and so that's kind of my basic question. I mean, one argument could be that patents actually facilitate the spread, the diffusion of kind of good new ideas. Uh, and another idea is that it actually is much more of a bottleneck. And kind of when I look at some of the admittedly very crude empirical research on this stuff, um, it looks as though it actually works much more as a bottleneck than anything else. So for example, when you're looking at non-practicing entities, there's been some interesting work out of Boston University, which claims that you know, non-practicing entities are causing about $83 billion in damage to innovative business enterprises. Uh, when you see that the R&D budgets of, kind of corporations in the US is in the neighborhood of $250 billion a year, that's a lot in the way of indirect costs. Uh, when you're looking at direct costs, it's something like $29 billion in licensing and legal fees and what have you. So 20, you know, that's, that's a lot more than a tenth of these R&D budgets. Uh, so you know, I would want to know, do we have any reason to believe that since we allowed you know, these mathematical algorithms to be patented, have we seen far more innovation than we would have in the absence uh, of seeing this. And again, it's quite possible that we do see way more innovation than we would in their absence. Uh, I just have seen no convincing reason to believe that that's the case. Uh, so I, I tend to think that the burden of proof should be shifted toward those who think that we should build these roadblocks. So Alan, you had a, you disagreed with me at the very beginning. Uh, can you elaborate where you well, disagreed? Just on the, in the, like, when she was talking about the chemical arts, I mean, it's not that easy to find um, prior art, um, earlier patents and publications on chemical formulations. I mean, you still have to find variations on uh, the, the chemistry that you're looking at. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. You but, can, but you can define, structure, well, you, you, but you can define structure in lots of different ways, just like in the software context. So you can use, uh, you can use all different structures, and there's all different terminology that's used in the pharmaceutical or chemical uh, space as well. It's not so easy as putting in a name and spitting out all the results. You have to look at lots of different variations in order to be able to do it. I think there is a problem in the software context. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. It's claimed and described very broadly uh, using lots of consistent, inconsistent language. There are not great and easy mechanisms to use to search and find the materials that you're looking for. So when you get to my second question, not the first question of whether it should be patentable, subject matter that should be patentable, but whether it meets the threshold of patentability, I think there are some issues there. It's hard for examiners and for uh, people that are at companies to find um, technology out there that predates the work, just to see, well, one, to find patents that may be blocking them, or two, to find prior art that may invalidate those patents. It's very hard to find that information in the software context. Um, I found that in my own practice, and I think probably most of the people on the panel would agree with that. Okay? Can I, I think uh, maybe I spoke imprecisely and so you thought I said something slightly different about chemicals. And that's obviously not the, the topic today, but I meant there, you don't have a lot of accidental infringement cases among pharma companies because if you're like, I want to make molecule X, I wonder if there's a patent on that particular molecule. That is actually very easy to search because you can search databases based on molecules and they pop up whether there are patent applications on those. And that, that's what I was saying. Well, yeah, I, w I would agree. I mean, it's a different, 
a different industry. Yeah, so absolutely. In, a in the pharmaceutical context, everybody's working on a single molecule. Yeah. Okay? And we're not adding different things to the mo molecule. So, yeah, <coughs> it's not so easy to go and find everything that covers that molecule, but if you put enough resources on it, you know, you can, you can dig down and find it. Aren't but we're not building are, things around it. Aren't there also probably at least an order of magnitude fewer players in chemicals than there are in software? Uh, I think people would argue it both ways, perhaps, perhaps. It's a, it's a different issue. I mean, the issue we have in the software context, and you have to separate out two questions here. One, should software be uh, something that can be protected <coughs> under our law? And two, does a given invention, assuming it is something that could be protected under law, meet the requirements of patentability? And it's the second question, in my mind, that raises a lot of these problems. What is already out there? You can only get a patent on things that are new and non-obvious variations on what's already out there. So determining when an invention is new and a non-obvious variation of a pre-existing technology is where all the work is. And that's the difficulty. Where, where, does that, where does that burden lie? Right? Does it lie at the PTO at the examination stage? Yes. Yeah, so does it lie at the litigation stage? Well, we've, we've mixed all that up here in the discussion, and that's, right. that's uh, unfortunate, I think. But when you're getting a patent, the issue is addressed in the patent office. And it's the examiner's job to go and look at what you've claimed as an invention and try to find prior art, prior technology, prior disclosures that preclude you from getting that patent. So can I make two comments about sure. this? So one is um, the vast, vast majority, and I forget the percentage of patents, are, are never licensed and never litigated. And so there's a lot of arguments that say if you, really, you know, if you really wanted to double or triple the amount of time that patent examiners put into determining if patents were valid, that would be, that's also pretty dumb because most of the patents are never going to go anywhere or do anything. Um, but I, so that, that's just one thought. The second, thing, the second question is, but what does that do to the person that is, they just want to make their product, and they they know there's a bunch of people out there. A lot of them are non-practicing entities that aren't even trying to, you know, protect things that they mm -hmm. are also producing, um, and they just want to get their product out there. And they can't even find out sort of the landscape of potential liability. Not even to make a reasonable business risk assessment, whereas you know maybe this will happen, maybe this won't. Like, what do you tell these people? That's a good, very good question, and it's a hard question to answer. But the short answer and the true answer is, don't worry about it. Well, that's, what? That's all, <laughs> <laughs> and, let, and let me explain why. Go forward with your product, and if you become <coughs> successful, that's when you're going to become a target. But if you become successful, you'll have the resources. That's, but that's wait, wait, absolutely wait, not true. Let me, let me just ask, successful is a, especially in the software world, oh. is a radically relative term. So if I'm an app developer in the App Store and I sell 100,000 units at a dollar, I'm successful. Like there's a chance that you could call me successful. There's no way I can afford a patent lawsuit, especially if my app has pull to refresh, which is like now essentially a UI standard across across the platform. But it's patented by Twitter, right? right. If I sell a million units at a dollar, am I successful? What's the threshold that you're telling me that I should now have to pay some cost to some other person who has some patent I didn't well, know about? Let's look at it from the flip side. Okay. No. If, 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 <laughs> let's not do that. If, I, if I'm a patent What's owner. What's the threshold? You're on, you're on the stand. Here's, yeah, how, here's how I'm going to answer it. All right. If I'm a patent owner, what's the threshold that causes me to go after you with litigation? Because it's going to cost me money to litigate against you. So if I can only extract so much in money, royalties from you, I'm not going to bring a lawsuit unless I can recoup the money that I invest in the lawsuit. But, that's not, but, often it's, but often the cost is a letter, right? Like if you're talking no, about non-practicing entities, you send a letter to several hundred people. Sure. You might sue a few of them, but the reality is most of them out of fear are going to say, listen, if it costs me $24,000 to even figure out whether this patent is valid and I infringed it, and you're only <coughs> asking me for 10000 bizarrely, even though I have no idea if this is a good patent, I might just pay you. And that's a business model for a lot of companies. Uh, I agree with you, and that's one of the problems we have in our system, is but entities that don't develop and sell technology on their own. They own patent rights, and they try to go after people and collect royalties from them. It's a real problem. So and it affects small companies much more. It, it affects big companies as well. Yeah. But it's really hard on the on. The so what's the solution <laughs> then? So I mean, if, 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 if everybody on the panel, including you, yeah. agrees that patent trolls are a bad idea, how do we solve that? Um, there, unfortunately, there are no <coughs> easy solutions that anybody's come up with at this point. 
there are, have been changes in the law recently that are helpful. Um, uh, we would, somebody else, I don't remember who was talking about it, but there, there have been some new changes in the law. We have new procedures at the Patent Office that are now uh, available to challenge patents. But all of those procedures still are, are costly and difficult for, uh, particularly for small businesses. I will tell you what I actually think is a good solution, even though it is politically infeasible. And I really think it's true. Having an independent invention defense, which is the following. If you, you don't know about the patent, you've never seen a product in, that instantiates the patent, through your own innovation, you make something that happens to infringe the patent that you should be able to market your product using what you've done free and clear. And here's the reasoning behind it within the system of the patents, within the patent system. So the idea of the patent system is that we're supposed to be incentivizing invention that you would not have gotten otherwise had there been no patent system. If you would have had products that were developed and sold without the patent system, then the patent system is acting as a law, like as creating loss for the system because then other people can't copy it. I submit that if someone else is going to invent the exact same thing and not seek a patent on it and bring a product to market using that uh, like invention, then you didn't need the patent system in the first place in order to incentivize the creation of that thing. And so you get all the same inventions that you would have had before, and many more people are free to, do, uh, to invent and market products. How would you test for independence there? So I think the copyright system does this relatively well, even though it's obviously different because it's, you know, you're not going to, um, you, it's much easier to sort of potentially look at stuff and see if you directly copied something. Um, but you look to see if someone was exposed to the copyrighted material and, you know, there, the presumption can switch if something is omnipresent, right? If there's something that someone had done sort of privately and shared with their friends, you probably have to show that the potential copier was exposed to it. If it was the number one hit song on the radio for five months, courts will generally assume that you've heard it, right? So I, I think that courts can work this out and that it will make a big difference to the system because most, obviously not like, you know, the patents, the Apple Samsung thing, different story, but most of these cases are where people just had no idea that the thing was patented. So Gregory, do you think, I mean, to give you a response, yeah, do you think that is an actual fair system? I, I don't. And, and the reason why is that, you know, you, you think of s systems where what we're trying to do with a patent system is to, first of all, publish, you know, make something available to other people. <laughs> if you have eliminated uh, if you need to be able to actually know about the invention beforehand, then you are not going to pay attention to anything anyone has ever done. You're going to want to be completely deaf to everything right, else that's, that's, that's going on. Every tech firm, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. don't no, I don't. I don't. I, I just because every tech firm is terrified of, of, of trouble damages for willful infringement. Yeah. So their engineers sit in one room and the lawyers sit in another room, and the lawyers are like sweating and panicked while the engineers do their job. And then you get trouble damages in a Samsung case. Well, <laughs> I, I don't want this to just be about the Samsung case. <laughs> but it's, it's sitting right here for me. <laughs> I, it's like a layup. Yeah. So, no, I, sorry, you, I, 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 I think that the issue is that ultimately the engineers do talk to other people they work with. Sure. They do know what's going on in the world. And regardless of whether or not they've read a particular patent and they're worried about willfulness, um, which is basically you're aware of the patent, you didn't care, you didn't care, and you infringed anyway. You knew it was you, you had a, but there's anyway. Basically, you knew about it, you ca didn't care, you continued to infringe. Um, and you know, I, I think that's ultimately I agree that that's a bad bad situation where where you have the sep separate between separate the. Uh, lawyers from from the engineers but on the other hand what's worse not having a patent system where nobody knows anything and nobody sh ever shares anything well actually let me, so can, I, can I piggyback on that for a second yeah can I we've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can follow uh, we've been very I'm gonna try to do this again and come up top what you're talking about sharing and uh, publication is I think the lost part of the patent debate right because the idea of the patent system is I will now give the world what I know. Like I wrote this software, I made this algorithm, I created this molecule, I'm gonna publish a, a specification for it, and the world will have it after my monopoly over it runs out. 
I would argue that in the software case, the value of that specification is very low because smart software engineers can copy what you did very easily. Uh, and, the va and the value of the specification is also very low because they're written to be as oblique as possible, right? And even if you said something insane like, we have to publish the code as part of your spec, it doesn't matter because what you're really saying is what you really want is the algorithm, the underlying mathematics of it, uh, which isn't patentable. So the patent lawyers dance around it by saying, here's some vague description of like a data processor takes a bit and then turns the bit into gold and the gold shines and then we're all sparkly and that's the patent. And like that literally makes no sense because the value of the, the value, the exchange the public derives from handing this monopoly to an inventor isn't there. Right, it's Apple's patents on every function of the iPhone don't help Google in the end, which is w what the idea should be. That when the term of the, the patent is over, Google can go read all of Apple's patents and say we can build an iPhone out of this. And I don't think that's happening, and I, I, I would submit to you that that's actually the fundamental failing. That's a, that's well, a valid point. It's actually one of, one of the oh, suggestions I'll that I'll I, oh, sorry. Uh, he can, you know, he I was going to say it's one of the suggestions that I have. I think we need to tighten up the uh, requirements and have clarity in the requirements of what needs to be disclosed in applications that are directed ultimately to software. I don't think there's enough there and I don't think there's enough consistency from one patent to the next. Do you so, think? Okay, so I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Very quickly. So I absolutely agree with the last two uh, <laughs> comments, right? So um, the disclosure requirement, the idea that, you know, you, you share your invention so it's not a secret and then people can use it. First of all, innovation in software happens much faster than if you're thinking about things were like, you know, 200 years ago. So like everything's like change, 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 change. So the 20 year period, not very helpful. Second of all, people can't find it anyway, as we just discussed. So it's not like the disclosure is effective because people do can't actually find the patents to read them. Um, there was a study done about in nanotechnology, so not software, um, where uh, some, uh, Lisa Willett at Yale had a bunch of nanotechnology, sorry, doctorates of physicists, I apologize, um, read nano, to do nanotechnology, read nanotech patents and see if they could recreate the invention. Most of them said they learned some stuff, but they couldn't actually recreate it. Uh, no one said they thought they could recreate it. So even then, disclosure not super helpful. And sec and, and finally, as, as uh, sorry, Nilay? Nilay. Nilay was saying, um, so software, you don't have to keep put the code in. And the most of the work comes from trying to figure out how to implement the algorithm in the larger piece of software that you're trying to write. And so just having that algorithm is not really going to be like, ah, now this is so easy and I don't have to do any work. That's not what's going to happen. Yeah, so Christopher, did you have yeah. Sorry, go. Well, I just had a question. I mean, I mean, from a historical perspective, um, you know, there was a time when, um, uh, right, like you mentioned that the, the term of patents now is probably too long. So it, it makes me wonder if innovation has picked up, why shouldn't, you know, patents only last two years or something? If another issue is that we're not publishing uh, anywhere near the time that the invention is actually happening, you know, why not add requirements there? I mean, another thing is if we're if we're doing software and the issue is disclosure, why doesn't the the U.S. Patent and Trade Office have like a code repository like GitHub or something? And it's like, <laughs> and it's like, it's like, hey, you want to patent this? Like, I mean, give us your Apple code. And Google like putting their code. In. No. no. <laughs> okay. So here's the classic example, right? So like, so like, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the the secret formula for Coke isn't patented because then it's not a secret anymore, right? right? So if yeah. we if we well, add the exactly right, right? if we add the burden, right? But but think about how it's actually being used in this case. Okay. Apple could very well keep the code, and I, they have, right? The code for kinetic scrolling in the iPhone is secret. You don't have that. Android doesn't have that. Google had to like, so, figure it out. But what they have done is they've given themselves 20 years where no one can use that feature. Because they broadly defined it to just be kinetic scrolling. And that's like that's not a Which makes sense when you're inventing like a steam engine and, 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 and it's like the eighteen hundreds and, and, and the US patent office is full of models. I mean you usually give, have to give them a physical model. Talk about a burden. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so we're, not, we're nowhere near that. Just, just, just as a follow up, I mean I, I just wanna hear what the panel uh, their th thoughts on the API decision. Uh, for people that are not familiar with the API decision, this was a uh, uh, Oracle to Google uh, based on uh, this is a copyright decision. Yeah, yeah, but uh, since we're talking about how, how hard it is to code and like come up with the actual processes, there's like, you know, having that information out there, does that make it uh, easier to like, to make the code and does that give away too much information? Uh, should the court have strengthened the actual requirements there as well? 
Well, I don't think having the code in the application makes a difference. I mean, if you have the functionality and good solid yeah. flow charts as to what's happening, that's all you need to, to write your own code. Um, but you need to have the underlying information, the details of what it is and how it works. I don't think the code really is the answer. It's, that's just a, a burden and you're going to have more information out there to search through that no one's going to be able to find. I want to go back to this issue, though, of information, too much information, not being able to find it. One of the things that the Patent Office is really good about, and they've been doing it for 200 years, is classifying information. Every invention that's submitted, every application that's submitted, um, gets looked at and gets sent to an examiner who is, covers particular classifications. So they have all knowledge, all technology, since all time, broken down by this classification system. So what you have to do when you're looking for information is find the right area to look in and then focus on that particular area. You know, in the 1800s or the early 1900s, if you wanted to find somebody else's patents, what did you have to do? You had to do a physical manual search at the patent office. Today, you can go on your computer and you can go to any one of a number of search engines to look for any of this information. Yeah, there's a lot more information out there, but the resources we have available to find the information are so much greater but today I mean, than they I mean, were yesterday. Yeah, the other lawyers on the panel find that to be true? Of that I mean, you could actually well, easily it, find and it, categorize the information? I wouldn't say easy. I mean, there's a lot Is of information out there. software? It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, not. Well, so looking for software, looking for software is not going to help you. But our, the, it's the our functionality that is, is software patents. One of the categories is explicitly not software. And I would also argue that at the rate and pace of innovation in the software market, I mean, I do think that like the kids in Wichita who are coming up with new apps and new UI standards, they should be compensated if they, right? They, they should be able to get a, the, Lauren Brichter who invented pull the refresh, right? That's Brilliant. Like, it, that's a brilliant concept. It is what dominated, is it? pull the refresh, you guys oh, have the Twitter yeah. app, it's all yeah. over the iPhone. He invented it, like, he put it in his app. Like, he should probably be compensated for it in some way. Do I but he shouldn't be compensated for that for 20 years. Yeah. And he shouldn't be able to submarine that patent. And if you read that patent, it's like very strange, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say, this is a patent on pull the refresh. It doesn't have like a GIF animation of like, this is my patent, right? It's, it's in this language of like lawyers. <laughs> like it's a bad language. Like what well, we're all all we're arguing about. Right, but, but, but land like, deeds are in legal language. So, right. Let me just. Let me, yeah, I, go, I really, go. I like you. I want to hear you. No, no. I'm <laughs> sorry. I just got really excited. Yes. Go, go, go. No, we're, not, we're, we're we're here. Um, but you saying that the patent office is searchable? They've done this great idea. I I would argue that most of the people at the patent office I talk to say they're overworked and overburdened. So they're like. Their historical greatness of classifying is like breaking down under their burden. And second of all, the kid in Wichita doesn't know about that. And right, he shouldn't have to have some institutional knowledge that the patent office has been good at categorizing information for 200 years before he writes an app. And if his app is successful, he shouldn't then be surprised by some guy who wrote a patent in the 90s on like wavelet encoding showing up and being like, by the way, I own the rights to every streaming video application that exists. And that is happening. And that, like, you can't, you can't tell me the patent office is good at, at calcifying information. Should somehow backtrack into before you write an app, you should know that there's some patent on, on like encoding. Yeah, those, they're, they're two different things. One is trying to find information that's out there. It's not easy, but there are good tools out there if you take the time but and I, spend I the money to look if for it. The information was truly, truly out there and truly meaningful. If the exchange was working, if the public policy goals of the patent system were like at their highest peak then what the kids could do, and I keep, I'm going to just keep talking about the kids because that makes me sound great. Uh, <laughs> if it was truly working, the then we would have this library of expired technology patents that you could go and you could build something out of them. That is not happening, right? The exchange piece of this, this puzzle is not there, right? The value that the, the system is getting out of the, of the patents is not exposed to the citizens in a way that is meaningful to them. So and I, I would say that if you could do that, if everything was exactly the same, but the disclosure was so good that you could go go on the web and like read a library of expired patents that would help you create some new product out of great ideas that people have found patentable in the past, then I'd be like, look, Are it's you working. saying that for everything? Because I think like, right, say, like wheel, wheels on suitcases uh, or something like that that was patented, you know, 
a long time ago. But I was, no, was going to say it's happened in other areas. It's not yeah. yet happening in the uh, IT space, but it's right. I would say it's particularly a problem in software. I think in other areas it's there. So, sure. Can I, I wanted to bring up something that's re like really important in this discussion that none of us have mentioned yet, which is that there's two different intellectual property systems that protect software. Right, so um, you can patent particular, basically be particular algorithms, but just by writing down code, it is copyrighted automatically. And so even if you don't get any patents on your software, if you don't license it in any particular way and you just put it out there, other people can't copy it verbatim, right? So, so your comment was, you know, uh, you know, a, a kid should be able to make an app and, and profit from it. And the copyright system does allow that to happen, even if you're not patenting. And so there's an important question about the interaction between these two systems. And is, you know, if we're going to have copyright for software, which used to be controversial, um, but, you know, if we're going to have copyright for software, maybe you don't need patents for software because you're not going to have verbatim copying and stealing of whole programs. Right. This is, I mean, the reason Apple's lawsuit against Samsung was a patent and trade, I, I covered it a lot. <laughs> Forgive me. I mean, this was just a general comment. But, like, so, this but, is a, but thing it's, to think it's, about, it's, too. It's a good comment. I, but, it's literally Apple who has proven why that doesn't work. So in the 90s, Apple sued Microsoft. And they, in that case, was a copyright case. They said, you stole Windows from us. And you know they don't look exactly the same, but they look the same. And they said, you stole the look and feel of Windows from us. And they lost. That was a design pattern. Yeah, but they, no, it they, wasn't a design. It was but all they lost based. because it was, it, was the express, it was the idea, not the expression. Right, like that sounds fine to me. Right, like, but they tried, to, they, they tried they, to turn it. But, 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 but they wrote the code, both, part, both companies wrote the code But I don't think, themselves. I don't think, if you're, again, think of the children. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's gonna wear off. God, so, <laughs> I, never, I never get this argument. Yeah. I'm usually like, <laughs> everyone should drink all the booze. Um, no, uh, you're not gonna steal the app. I don't think, I mean, like straight piracy in that sense is like yeah. not the threat that we're talking. Right, Microsoft isn't going to steal Apple's code. Right. Samsung isn't going to steal iOS. What they're going to steal is the concepts that make the thing what it is. And that's why Apple tried to stretch their copyright case against Microsoft into look and feel. Because yeah. we have a copyright on our, on our UI, and they made a copy of it in some or sats way, and that extends into look and feel. And the court killed them on it. They, no, yeah. that's not right. They went to Samsung with a handful of design patents, a, hand, a handful of utility patents, uh, a bunch of trade dress claims, and they knocked it out of the park because the patent system offered them greater and more uh, precise protection for their inventions. Whereas, the, I mean, I used to be a copyright attorney. I actually was never a patent attorney. I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I don't, I don't, yeah. don't want to go too much into design patents. Uh, Wait, Chris, can we just take it? Yeah. Move so, toward. Um, yeah, questions. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. before we go too much further down the rabbit hole, maybe the audience has questions. Can, can I ask a stupid question about, uh, I'm a finance reporter, so money. Why isn't there, I mean, maybe there's a problem with the timeline, but so when you do infringe on a, on a patent, you're <coughs> stealing someone's idea and you're not paying. It. So why isn't the um, result of a of, of patent dispute not, you know, some. In, inordinate sum of money or like an incredible, you know, costly dealing with attorneys, whatever, why isn't there some licensing percentage of, oh, your, of your, your pay or like how does that work exactly and why doesn't that work well yeah, so to, to let you use that technology? So the, so the way the patent system works is that when you sue, you're trying to get money. And the money is, is comes in either two things. <laughs> one, one is a reasonable royalty, and there's a multi-factor test that takes into account all the, the things that you would negotiate if you negotiated a license at the time. And the other thing is lost profits. So if, it's, if the invention is such an integral part of whatever product you have, you can actually say, I would have sold you know, a million of these, instead I sold 500,000, and therefore the lost profits that I had is the, the other way to calculate damages. So I think to answer your question, it's often very difficult to evaluate what really is a reasonable royalty. I mean, I just worked on a case where literally the defendant came to trial uh, saying it was $250,000, and the plaintiff came to trial saying it was 1.1 billion. And that goes to a jury. And that goes to a jury. <laughs> but is it, is it, is it, is it, um, the, the, the way not to discourage the kids, you know, building the, the, the funny apps and the yeah, yeah. or wherever, 
like in terms of success, how does one calculate the success of their venture? Ba I mean, based on what they have. If, if, maybe maybe part of this is that the legal fees are out of control. But then, if there's no if there's no rewards that can be had at the end, other than just kind of knocking this person off the map. How, how do you uh, equate for this company that maybe makes $25,000? One of the so lawyers explained the difference between the, the compensation with the design patents and this, you know, the classical software patents, because now that's, you know, technology companies are going from So that are you talking about how much money they got in Apple and Samsung? Or no, no? I don't know. What you're, I, I don't understand I don't the question. I'm sorry. That, and then how well. Um, so so in a, in a, just in a, just a high level thing here, in, a, in an infringement case, litigation, the um, patent holder, if he proves that the patent was infringed, is entitled to damages to compensate them for infringement. And there are essentially two forms of damages, as was, was just explained, this reasonable royalty concept or lost profits uh, concept. And, and that's supposed to be a measure of how much the patent holder was harmed. So if you get a patent and somebody practices it without a license from you, that's what you can go after. And if you win, that's what you can collect, determined by a jury. So that's the numbers and the variation in the numbers is what often drives the, the settlement or the negotiation. If you're going to negotiate and grant somebody a license, you're looking at how much can I collect if I sue them? What's the, what's the patent worth? How much of the infringement has there been? How much profit are people making on the, on the product? And you're negotiating from there. Okay? So the, the two sort of go hand in hand. If you're talking about somebody coming up with an idea, patenting it, and trying to license their technology, what they're thinking about is how much they could collect So, if they were to sue. So th then the question becomes, what am I willing to offer access to the technology at? How much am I going to charge for access? And the two things kind of go uh, hand in hand a little bit. I don't know if that answers your, your question. But. Does it answer your question? Um, sort of. I'm still not quite sure how, I mean, it seems like the lawyer fee is the really the big piece here in terms of like discouraging the kids from making their, you know. Right. It is in addition to the amount that you have to pay if you lose, both sides have to spend a fair amount of money, which is often to get to a final judgment in the millions to figure out whether pat you act, whether someone infringed the patent. I think that's the way that the compensation. The overall I mean, standard is like 70 or 80 percent of all cases settled, like just across litigation. Uh, and I think it's it's much the same. I think it's the same number for patent <coughs> cases. But you end up paying for lawyers, and you end up paying some license fee. Or I mean, it, it's there's just money. It's just some and, settlement is driven though by the fact that if you went to the end, you would have already spent a certain no amount of money on your lawyers. And so you're going to be like, well, if I'm going to spend $2 million anyway on the case, and I can settle for less than that, it's just good business to settle for less than that. Another question? Yeah, I would like to make a provocative comment okay, <laughs> and get the panel's response. Okay. My provocative comment is that the reason software patents are so opaque is that software is not, in fact, patentable. The problem is every software patent, as I understand it, tell me if I'm wrong, has to be written as if it were not a software patent. It has to be written as if it were a machine or a device or something like that. And I would like to submit the idea that if software were made patentable, and if in fact every software patent had to be described as a piece of software, <coughs> the patents would be much less opaque, much more easily searchable, and perhaps might make some progress to uh, mitigating the various problems we're talking about. So the four lawyers, Alan, you want to start? Uh, not particularly, but OK. <laughs> 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 um, the problem with that is that what you have, people are claiming the functionality that the software provides. And I guess that gets to the heart of your point. Maybe they shouldn't be allowed to do that. But the value in the software is not in the actual code that's written because you can write software in multiple languages and you can you can get it to do the same thing in different ways. No, but if your implementation is in software, then it should be described not as a hardware machine, but in the language of functionality, but in the language of software, describing the functionality from the point of view of software, which is after all the form the invention takes. You know, in the automotive industry, if you invent the new gear, you describe it as a gear, you know? 
And by the way, in the automotive industry, I am told, there is a very cooperative form of royalty payments where companies are willing to license out their patents for reasonable amounts of money after much less than 20 years. And part of the reason for that may be the transparency of the system. Well, so, Tech yeah. Patent also has standard patents as well. Correct? Well, that's like a whole, yeah. you don't want to. So, <laughs> so, Christina? <laughs> I see what you're getting at. I still think it would be hard to search effectively because the thing that makes patents hard to search is when you're when you describe the claims using human language. It's the kind you have. To, people are going to use different words to describe the same things, different terms. There's not a standardized vocabulary you have to use, and so the the ease of searching isn't going to get simple enough that some someone could do a kind of kind of quick search the way you can do like is that the same molecule? Well, yes or no? Yeah. I, I see, I think though that's a nice, I mean, I, I hate when the system kind of, when there's like lies in the system, right? And so I, I, I don't like using machine claims, you know, system that does the following as opposed to this algorithm. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic. And I think actually more and more patents are written in a more kind of processy way after the State Street Bank case in, yeah. in the Federal Circuit, the, the, it was, the Federal Circuit kind of was like, ah, let's not worry too much about how we write these. So I think it's I think they're 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 not as machiney as much, but right. yeah, I I think it's it's maybe less of a problem than you might think, just because um, there's many different ways to claim an invention, and patent prosecutors know how to get across in the legal language whether or not you need to use hardware in the claim, sort of irrelevant to whether or not the claim is going to survive. Patent office survive litigation and so on. So uh, while it does it does address, I think, a genuine concern that you know a lot of times the claim claims themselves are not easy to understand from somebody who's coming at it with a non-lawyer, non-technical back or non-legalistic background. That is that is definitely a problem. Yeah. Right, but I think that has more to do with the difference between software and a gear, um, because I think most people, you know, who aren't familiar with software, it's much more abstract and much more difficult to deal with. for a process. I applied for, no, 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 I didn't get to that point. I went to the Jones Day and I said, uh, this is, you know, how does this work? And they said, okay, the first, it's going to cost $30,000 uh, for like a cheaper law firm. This is my friend who worked there. And you're going to get rejected right off the bat because that's what they do. Sorry, you spent this, but uh, that's what he said. He said, you know, the, fir the first time you submit, they're going to reject you right off the bat. And then you have to write in several different ways, as he said. So. Um, thinking of the kids, that's my experience with applying for a software patent. Um, so just, to, I agree with you, but I think it's interesting that the, the two practicing lawyers here were like, that's not a problem, because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just like the reason that the reason it's not a problem for you is because it grants you an enormous amount of flexibility as they serve their clients, and you should value that flexibility because your job is to serve your clients. But the question, the 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 bigger question is the category should be software, right? I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. And we keep arguing about whether or not software patents should exist or how we should regulate them or what their terms should be or anything or what the licensing regime for them should be. And we are just utterly failing to define them. Like every piece of this conversation is like almost invalidated by the fact that every single one of us has a different definition of software patent. And you can say it's under the big umbrella of process, or I can say uh, it's anything that's written in code, and that like the vastly different interpretations, and the legal system doesn't know, and the courts don't know. The State Street case, I think, is a really good example. The court's kind of like, yeah, let's try it this way for a while. And just like literally, it's like, let's see where the cards fall or the chips fall. And that's like, that is the key. Once you solve that problem, you can't solve the big question of what do we do about software patents unless somebody tells you uh, what a software patent is. And that's, that's, the, that's your provocative comment, but 
it, there's, it, a, there's a fundamental issue here, and that is that, and, and a misunderstanding, I think, that when you claim an invention, you're not just claiming your particular embodiment, the way you execute it. You have to look at what contribution that invention makes and then try to claim it as broadly as possible so that you can you can cover alternative implementations Which makes of it. it even harder for the poor guy in his garage to figure out if he's infringing it because it's written in this broad, confusing way. Uh, but it's I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and I, and I agree. You're right. You're right. But I also think the system has served us well over the last 200 years. I mean, nobody in this room can say that the pace of innovation in the mobile space right. is, is too slow. Right. And the, and the, nobody and can make that argument. I will, I will give you that. And, and, the, and, apart from that and, and the <laughs> point. No, no, but everybody else is settled with that. Well, and, the, and I was just going to say the point about um, licensing in the auto industry, it's happening in the IT space, and the smart companies will fight in the marketplace and not in the courtroom. In the meantime, some of the companies are making war on each other. They will eventually, I can't predict with certainty, but I think eventually they will cross license because it's mutually assured destruction. Nobody can win. You win one case, you lose the next one. It goes on. The only people that get rich are the lawyers, which is fine. Um, <laughs> uh, but the smart, the smart people, the smart people will, the smart businesses will cross license. Sure. The problem is for the small, the small. The small the, do you have another question on non-pressure? Sure. Uh, non uh, 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 I, have, I have a question about uh, patent trolling with regards to legal mechanisms around that. And I was wondering, is it possible to invalidate patent rights based on improper use legally? If a, a company oversues or has a lot of lawsuits thrown out um, or are not actually developing any sort of products or services related with patent rights they have, can they get their patent rights revoked? Can those go back to the marketplace in any way? If the patent is found invalid, <coughs> then the patent is no longer, then the, the invention is no longer patented, but a person can't sue too much or something. So there's, that, that doesn't, that mechanism. Do you think there, there, should there, be there are some be. people now that are starting to get creative in their defense of these NPE cases, and the NPE cases are, are a problem. Um, there are, uh, now people are, uh, companies are asserting defenses like uh, conspiracy defenses and, and all kinds of, uh, uh, clever uh, uh, techniques. Nobody's been successful as of yet. Striking down patents because somebody is doing something uh, improper or Sorry. sued without having a good basis to sue. I mean, people try that all the time. It hasn't been a very effective technique. By the way, there is, a, uh, there is a patent on patent trolling. It's like a drilling. It's like a drilling. No, it, it has been granted. I yeah. think like Schlumberger or, or a, dr a drilling company has it. So if you tried to um, <coughs> sue them, as an NPE, I think they would <laughs> counter sue and be like, no, we own the rights to <laughs> your trolling. That is a business strategy? So yeah, I guess so. Oh my well. god. You just have a patent yeah, on patent, 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 patent trolling? Uh, Greg, I mean, the Greg, fact that that exists makes me think that that patent, that that patent, patent should be available to everyone. Do you have a unique position on NPEs? And a Defense of them? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think. I think people most I think most of the panel would agree that there should be some kind of property right in a patent. Um, we'll we'll all disagree as to whether or not, you know, it should be strong, weak, whatever. But I think one of the big big problems with NPEs is that it's often very unclear what a patent is actually worth when you actually step in and litigate it. You can be in a situation where you can cross license or people can negotiate, but my experience is that you can be pretty reasonable on both sides and come up with wildly different numbers. And that's a real problem because, you know, if an NPE comes in and they think something is worth $50,000 um, and they sue somebody and they want to get a nuisance settlement, as, as was talked about before, that is, I think that is, you know, anti-competitive in some, some sense. But if, if an NPE comes in and they sue a big company that uses a big part of their technology, that, that patent should be worth something in terms of whether or not there's a reasonable royalty. Now, how you set up the incentives as to what the number is, the big problem is that nobody really knows when they read a patent or analyze an industry what that patent is really worth. And, and damages experts go and they, they try to figure that out and like I said, they come up with wildly different numbers. 
I want to hear a little bit more from the general two generalists at the table. Uh, give them a chance to speak. Uh, so, I mean, the elephant in the room, and it's been brought up several times, are these things like slide to unlock, and then specifically Apple versus Samsung. So, if you agreed with the decision in the case, d I mean, do you then think that m maybe, you know, what were they wrong to copy Apple? Uh, was there did it really hurt the economy or lead to inefficient behavior uh, by them doing this? And then also uh, your opinion if, they, if that case was decided correctly. Oh, as the person who showed up on time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a really, really hard question. I mean, so in the, case of, uh, in the case of Apple versus Samsung, it's a unique situation because Samsung was a supplier to Apple, so they had visibility into their product chain as much as two years in advance. So, you know, they knew that Apple was ordering, you know, however many million screens or processors, and it's pretty, I mean, that's why Steve Jobs says, I'm going to go thermonuclear war on these guys, because, you know, I think it was like this family situation where they had a very close relationship, and um, <coughs> Samsung just realized the iPhone's taking off, so let's copy it, you know? I mean, I mean, like, net-net, is that bad for innovation i mean it's that's really hard to say i mean if we if we're going to be empirical about it like let's go to a place like china where i gather the ip enforcement is somewhat non-existent yeah there's tons of innovation but like it's of a certain kind you know and is that because of the unique nature of the chinese market or or is it because if you create something there you know it has zero value as an idea so that's why, I mean, I think in general, it's naive to imagine that we're going to eliminate patents. And so I think that's why we're all talking about reform. I mean, it's, I, I think it's almost an impossible question to answer. I mean, you, you mentioned, like, how do you assess damages? I mean, how, how do you do that? I mean, you, you like, run a, a, a supercomputer simulation of the economy into the future? <laughs> Can you patent that system? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally, totally impossible. And so I think we're at this point where we have to... Um, Experiment, you know, you said we have 200 years of the patent system working for us. I mean, I mean, everybody believes they live in a special time, but like, I really think that like software represents a a departure in some ways, and we have to get creative about what that patent system looks like. And I mean, maybe there's a patent system that that is more rigid than what we have now, but is also more explicit, or it's written in pseudocode, so it's very searchable. I mean. We, I think we have to get really creative. I mean, the, the patent office I've read has a backlog of 700,000 patents that they have yet to even address. I mean, they're obviously totally overwhelmed. Maybe we need to, like, sick Ray Kurzweil and machine intelligence on the problem. <laughs> I don't know, but, like, we're really, I think, at this, like, departure point <coughs> where we can't eliminate patents. It's naive to think that's going to happen. And we have to do something, like, crazy, I think. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to point out, by the way, the iPhone is five years old. So, like, this explosion of litigation that we're seeing is literally five, it's just five years. And also, uh, the Samsung still makes the processor uh, system on a chip in the iPhone. Right, but that's not a change. Yeah. I, mean, I, I know we don't want to talk about not software patents, but most of the damages yeah. in Apple versus Samsung were design patent infringement, which is, like, super, which were, like, super crazy patents in that it really, like, one of them really was a rounded rectangle as the shape of... <laughs> of the thing. And, and second of all, the statute explicitly <laughs> says that if you infringe someone's design patent, you can disgorge them of all of their profits, not just profits attributable to the fact that someone wanted that design. And that was an intentional fix because in the 1800s, <coughs> design patent reward, awards were very low because people were like, oh, no one bought it for the design. And so the Congress fixed it by, by, by just, by, so the, the award is supposed to be like, this is everything you earned, Samsung. And so the point is, that, not to get into that topic, but it, that's a big part of that case, and, uh, and, and it's just not complete to, to just talk about it from a software perspective. Very briefly, uh, since we're so one of the issues is that it's very hard for us to gauge the counterfactual how much innovation would be likely to have seen in the absence uh, of you know kind of this regime of software patenting. But just a kind of fun historical example that some of you guys might find interesting. Uh, so you know James Watt hit upon the steam engine in the early 1760s. 1769 he was able to patent it. 1782, he secured an additional patent. And then throughout the 1790s, uh, he and his business partner, Nicholas Bolden, fought to destroy a, a superior alternative, the Hornblower engine. And they succeeded in destroying and ruining uh, Hornblower, at least for a while. Uh, and then 
for the 30 years following the expiration of Watt's patents, there was, sure enough, an explosion in the efficiency uh, of steam engines and an explosion in the diffusion of steam engines. Now, it could be that that's an ent entirely a coincidence, but my sense is that that's kind of unlikely. And that, again, I think that, you know, kind of have patents actually facilitated the diffusion of useful innovations? We actually have people on the, uh, on the panel who are <laughs> defending software patents who are explicitly saying that that's not actually the case because you're actually not deriving that much of value from kind of these published patents. Um, so, you know, again, I think that, you know, you could say that, gosh, mobile innovation is super, super fast, isn't it? But the thing is that, well, how fast would it be in the absence of these ideas? A, B, there's an issue of the tractable versus the intractable. Uh, you know, we tend to look at, for example, $29 billion in legal fees, and that's certainly a very, very big amount. But to some extent, the writing of software is an individual and expressive activity. And then also, you know, there's the universe of free software, collaborative software, and what have you. That creates a tremendous amount of value, only part of which is going to be captured uh, in, for example, GDP statistics or in the profit and loss of business enterprises. And so when you're thinking about that, it's incredible because it hasn't come up very much, has it? But I think that when you think about actually, the, you know, when you think about Linux, when you think about, you know, this universe of products that were created in this kind of free, open, collaborative way that is then commercialized in certain kind of discrete ways and then is destroyed uh, by patent lawsuits, I think that that's a pretty, pretty serious issue. And when you think about, again, just kind of general human progress, our ability to do more with the resources that we, the limited resources that we have, that's the thing that I think we really ought to be concerned about. So again, intractable versus tractable. When you're only in the domain of tractable and actually what's happening to existing business enterprises, I think that you're actually losing a huge amount uh, of the negative impact uh, of you know, these roadblocks to innovation and, and cooperation and collaboration. Wow, that's the first time we've been silent. <laughs> <laughs> Wham, you should have just dropped the mic and walked out. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Let me, you, let me ask you about Linux. Uh, Linux to me is fascinating. <laughs> and the open source movement to me is fascinating, right? Because it's this group of people that uh, kind of willingly give up scarcity, right? That's what they do. They, they publish to the world, they say, our, our work is no longer scarce. But we're going to charge you because our work is so complicated and nerdy that you can't use it without our help. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the well, model for every Linux company that I can think of. Yeah, it, it's, uh, a, it's a support model. So the software is typically free, and then they charge you for the support. Yeah, it does. Like, yeah. Wow, this is really awesome, but you're never going to figure it out. $400 now, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great model. But they, so they create this like alternate scarcity, right? And that's great, I think, for them. But the thing with Linux is that they built an operating system, right? An operating system is this complicated machine, right, that runs a computer. And Microsoft runs around saying, uh, well, we did that first. We solved all these problems. We got into a fight with Apple. We cross-licensed <coughs> with Apple. They had this famous cross-license, which if you read it is tremendous because it says it has like an anti-cloning provision. You want to know why Windows Phone doesn't look like iOS or Android? It's because Microsoft's prevented from doing it because they have an agreement with Apple to not clone any of Apple's technology. Um, but you can't do that all the time, right? And it's not really a roadblock. The fact that Microsoft built Windows first and like invested in building Windows and these core technologies of an operating system is not a roadblock to Linux. But they did it anyway, and nothing stopped them. What it is is the people who made Linux that they can have the ideals and they can they can eliminate the scarcity from their product, but they have to recognize the fact that under our system, somebody else did it first. And that first is really valuable, right? Because promoting the the, the what the useful the progress of the science and arts is really a race to make things first. If you get there first, you will be rich. And that is, in American history, a pretty huge incentive. So the Linux guys, I understand, right? They did something great. But they're saying, we're going to do something great, and we're going to get rich in this alternate business model that doesn't depend on our scarcity. And Microsoft is saying, well, we did it the traditional way. <coughs> and you're stepping all over the things that we built first. You're taking the concepts that we built to, to, to make Windows, and you're using them to build Windows so you can make money in this alternate way. You should have to pay us for that. I don't see that as a roadblock, so I see that as a tax. Well, Microsoft had a different view on software patents in the early 1990s than the view that right, they have now. Like or, yeah, well, I, well, and I think that, you know, and there's a reason for that, right? Because once you become an incumbent, then, of course, you want to actually kind of, you know, attack new entrants. And personally, and again, this is my being an ideologue, I see that as a more pervasive problem with kind of, 
you know, modern political economy. I see this as a kind of epiphenomenon of a much larger situation in which people use regulatory smash. They use regulations and other protections in order to insulate themselves from, from entry. Um, so I guess sort of my, my broader thought about this, and, and I, I, honestly, I can't really speak, I, you know, there are other people who will contest, I mean, sort of, you know, kind of who came first. I mean, I guess yeah. Stallman would certainly contest your narrative about Microsoft sure. being the big innovator. Um, but when I look at the kind of larger technology innovation landscape, I think that there are two big things that we miss. Um, one is user-led innovation in general. So, you know, obviously Jonathan Zittrain, these guys are talking a lot about the generativity of different platforms. Uh, and I think that in a way, the shift away from kind of generative platforms is partly a function of the patentization of kind of this landscape. It's a kind of defensive move. And I think that that's a bad thing because, you know, certainly those guys you're talking about are nerds. But when you actually make things more generative, <laughs> when you make things more accessible, then you kind of allow for more innovation. But of course, when you democratize innovation in that way, those are precisely the kind of people who are going to run into these roadblocks blocks, that is, they don't have the resources in order to determine whether or not they're infringing, et cetera. So kind of my mental model is that it's better to democratize the capacity to innovate as much as possible. And I, I see this as kind of a way to kind of prevent that from happening. The other thing is, well, then kind of what do innovative business enterprises do when they don't have the ability to build moats around their innovations? Uh, and, I, you know, my model is actually that the most innovative companies, what they actually do is invest in the human capital of their consumers. So for example, before Google came along, there wasn't this category of human being called searchers. But Google actually invented a kind of person who is a searcher. And actually, they it's make. Terrifying. Well, but, but it's true. So the thing is, what they did is they made us hungry, they made us want information fast. Right. You know, they actually kind of really have reframed their customer. And that, the thing is that, you know, what are most of these entrepreneurs? They're actually systems integrators. They're actually value added resellers. They're actually recombining lots of ideas that exist in the universe. But actually, the best of them, or you know, think about Disney, uh, they've created this line uh, called the Disney Princess line huge source of value for them. I mean, that's what innovative business enterprises do. They actually create, they kind of reinvent their uh, consumers rather than actually this all being about kind of upstream innovation. So, you know, you could have like 10 people who are actually working with the same building blocks, but actually they're able to differentiate that way. The Google example to me wraps in a lot of what we've talked about, right? Uh, because in the Google example, you could very fairly frame Stanford as an MPE, right? They paid for Larry and Sergey to be there and do whatever weird drugs they did to come up with Google. Uh, and they took a license, right? I mean, they left there and said, we're going to start Google. And Sam said, great, pay us for PageRank. That is, that's a win. Like, I see that as an enormous win for Stanford as, in this case, essentially a troll, right? Like, not, not in the classic sense, but like, <laughs> as an NPE, like, they're not going to do anything with page ranks. It's provided them with facilities, and kind of much, I think that their claim is way But they're an NPE, how do you regulate against the trolls like, without touching Stanford? How do you say, how do you say to, to, to uh, early Google, you're going to start a company and Microsoft is going to step all over you by taking away the fundamental thing, the fundamental core algorithmic achievement that you've accomplished. This gets to another you, related, this gets to another related public policy issue about Baidu. I don't want to go there. I want to yeah. go there. Well, but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> So, no, 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 but the, re the reason to go there is that, it, so the thing is that actually, this is not a 200 year history, right? In 1980, there was a law passed called, you know, by Dole, that said that actually, if you actually produce research on a university campus that can be patented and used in X, Y, and Z ways, that wasn't the case before 1980. So before 1980, and what I consider to be a better regime, Stanford wouldn't have been able to extract that because is it's kind of like, look, uh, maybe not good for Stanford. I think it's good for the world, and I think it would be just right. fine for Stanford because I think Larry and Sergey would have been happy to give Stanford so, a quite a bit of money after the fact. Get, maybe we should get a little less detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I think you 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 may hit on a really interesting philosophical topic when you were like, if Mike, let, let's say for sake of conversation, you know, if, if Microsoft makes Windows first, like, don't they deserve, in some sense, to have a monopoly on whatever those function, I'm oversimplifying, yeah. those functionalities I, over I, Linux. I and so, like, one set, so, like, there's an important kind of underlying thought here, though I think my search cost thing is sort of outside of it, as to whether you deserve something if you do it first, or whether we only should give patent rights if you're going, if those patent rights are going to incentivize you to do something that people wouldn't otherwise do, such that we wouldn't have this technology because there's another model of innovation where if you have a lot of different competitors you know you have instead of like one big idea you have you know windows then you have slightly better operating system and then other, someone else makes a slightly better operating system and people make small improvements that make products much better over a long over over sure. a short period of time and so like that's that's another model and you know you can see in a lot of other industries where you see like small improvements over a period of time or there might be less pending that that's pretty around. good let's say it wasn't Microsoft was first. Let's say it was the Linux guys, 
and Microsoft came in and said, well, that's great. You have a cool model. We're going to take everything we built and build but Windows is, on top of it. Doesn't that screw them? The exact, this is sort of taking the idea versus the exact but, kind of yeah, way but of doing we're, it. We're so not exactly necessarily, because right? maybe Microsoft does it better. I mean, like they say Steve Jobs stole half of the things that he did, too, from like other companies and just made them like stylistically better. It's a little more comfortable in your hand because they did a bunch of science to figure well, out the way it would They move around and they have ideas and they, they're working for one company and then they go to another company. Well, that's no, that, that involving actual, not involving but actual but, stealing. But people, settled you know, creative, right? I mean, they got sued and they, they evaluated and they well, I guess there's, there's, there's two different issues. I mean, there's incremental yeah. innovation where you're making incremental improvements. And that's what we've got in the mobile phone space. And there's a problem because there's a lot of patents there now. Okay? Hmm. And, and there's more and more every day. And then you have totally new technology. Well, totally new technology isn't being blocked by patents because it's new. Okay, so, so the idea that patents are going to stop that type of innovation, I think is a, it's, a, it's a false well, argument. I, I the incremental innovation is what we're talking about. Yeah, it's becoming harder and harder to innovate in certain areas because of the number of software and, patents. And what you're saying answers Ray Holmes very forcefully offered counterfactual on the Steam engine. If you don't see... It's not a counterfactual, that's the history of the steam engine. <laughs> your, counterfactual, your, your counterfactual is a supposition that history would have played itself out differently. That's the counterfactual. Forcefully offered. But if you have something that's new, and you see it, and you don't know that you can protect it, then you go somewhere else with your effort and your energy and do it where you can be protected. Do, that's do right. Do you, do you, that's, ex that's exactly right, and that's exactly and so that's my point. bigger counterfactual. Nobody so is going to... People who have genuinely new ideas don't have any surety that their ideas are going to be protected. They go somewhere where they know their ideas and their efforts are going to be protected. It's as simple as that. That's exactly... Uh, do you agree with that? Or? Uh, do, do, I mean, I, I, the idea of an entirely new technology that is not built on kind of earlier innovations, I, I kind of haven't identified one yet. I, I'm sure maybe one exists, but I, I certainly don't think of one. Well, the first operating system for a computer, the first mobile phone. You, you don't think that that built on kind of earlier ideas? Uh, operating system? No. No. Well, that's an interesting point of view. I, I, I guess I don't share it, but, you know, yeah, I guess that's a legitimate difference of opinion. Well, if you're in the, if you're in the thrall of the currently fashion marine's idea, then you see the world that way, but it's not the history of the world. We People have figure out how to smelt iron, Simone. and they, they beat their neighbors who are using bronze. It's a new technology. Simone, do you have a question? Yeah, so the problem here does not seem to be, you guys all seem like you're in agreement, more or less. Heating agreement is the name. With, 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 on, on like, on, maybe maybe with the exception of, uh, sorry, Rehan, Rehan? Um, it's all the same event. <laughs> uh, but like, the problem doesn't seem to be the idea that like, you need to, like, okay, there's questions about what exactly is new and what is whatever, but there should be some incentive for like having your work preserved and like you having a right to that if you thought of it first. Okay, beyond that, it just seems like the compensation system's messed up. And it's all about the money here. Is there a way of, <laughs> is there a way of, of making it so that, you know, the little guy is protected on some level, as, as with this cause example, or this, you know, is there some way of changing the way the money moves so that you can get a patent, or you can you can at least apply for a patent with some reasonable chance of success without having to shell out thirty thousand bucks a week? So she's a financial. Yeah. Tech, so she always goes back to the money. I, <laughs> I just don't think you need patents on software in order to incentivize things in the following sense: copyright takes takes care of pure piracy, right? Like it being taken from you and and copied, and you getting not and you not being paid for copies of your software. Right. If we're talking about someone else implementing the same kind of idea, like having to write the code themselves is the same effort that you put into doing it also. Right. It's not trivial to copy the algorithms and to put it into your system in a way that works. And so as far as I'm concerned, the system is perfectly fine in terms of incentivizing people to make new, innovative, and interesting software because they can still sell copies of it. And if someone else writes a better Microsoft Word, good for them. It's better for the rest of the world because people can then buy that version, which is better. Wow. Okay, Greg, and then... Uh... Yeah, so, so there are a couple things. So one is that at the patent office, I haven't looked at the, the way it's defined, but there's something called small entity status. And so you can have lower fees if you qualify as a small entity. And generally, that means that you're either a university, which isn't so small, but 
or yeah. you're an independent inventor or you're sort of a uh, number of ways to qualify. Second thing is there are proposals to create sort of a small claims patent court that would put smaller patent cases sort of off the track of going into the big district court where all of these fees are so immeasurably high. Um, you know, how you would implement that, I, it would be difficult. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's something worth looking at. So you, you don't think that software shouldn't be patentable at all, but uh, so what about processors that you could actually <coughs> program the actual into the processor itself, like a, a field, like, yeah, an FPGA, yeah. So, I mean, I think the real problem with a lot of the patent system is that people can't figure out what they're infringing, and this is a problem for many, many areas of the patent system and requires a wholesale change in how it works. In terms of, like, technically the way patent law has developed is that patentable, like, yeah, or like, I, sorry, I didn't know exactly what you said, but I mean, it sounded like a hardware thing. So I'm like, yeah, exactly. yes, <laughs> well, right? So but I mean, it, it, do, are there many other areas besides software where search costs for someone who's just trying to avoid infringement are unbelievably high? Yes, and that's a huge, huge problem for inventors in a lot of different industries. Well, no, we've done ourselves kind of a disservice here, by, and I'm just as guilty as anybody, but um, <coughs> we've talked about software patents in terms of these trivial features the iPhone, which is great, and that's software. But there are many companies in this world who invest a great deal of money in software that is extraordinarily complex and should, frankly, be patentable. Like Dolby sits around coming up with audio compression routines all day long. They're implemented solely in software. Uh, surround sound is a, a software problem that happens, sometimes it's expressed in hardware decoder chips or whatever, but the thing that they're doing is they're writing math to like make sound go around. Uh, there's a, any number of those companies exist. That is a very different kind of software problem than slide to unlock. Um, and that's what I mean. It's we, we've done such a poor job of bracketing off software that we can't even make that distinction. We're like, it's software. Like somebody wrote it in C and now, <coughs> now it should be banned or not banned. But I would argue that we, I think this, this entire room would probably agree that we should look at pull to refresh or slide to unlock as a software problem much differently than Dolby surround sound. They, they just in, instinctively, you know, they're different problems and they inc it required much more of a cost to solve. Do all the, does everybody on the panel agree with that, that they're two distinct problems? They, they are because one of them is like a stupid patent, right? Like there's a, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious, like there's, there's, a, there's a lot of issues here, but some of them, well, one, right, right, I'm but saying one of them, one of them, one of, one of them is that there's a lot of patents which are on stupid things that should never have been granted. And I think everyone on the panel agrees that there's a lot, like, you know, there's a lot of patents that are really simple and just are not innovative leaps. Um, and, but you know, I, I don't see why another audio company that's like, oh, I see this company is doing a really good job at audio compression. I, I think my engineers are better and can figure out a way to do that better, right? Because they need to figure out, they're not copying anything from you. They just need to, like, they need to figure it out themselves using their own research and effort. And I don't see why they shouldn't be allowed to do that. But, but reverse engineering is a very wait, real hold problem. Now you're starting against patents. But like you're, you're way off a of software path. They're literally just arguing against patents. Not necessarily, necessarily. I think there's good reasons to think you wouldn't get as many um, pharmaceuticals without the system because it because the amount of money that goes into research and development is so incredibly high, and it takes so long <laughs> to, to get that back. But that's because the FDA yeah. exists. Does anybody think there should be no patents? Is that a question? No, I have a, a different question. It's sort of general, so. <laughs> it's like, what time are you eating? <laughs> First versus best. I mean, are we talking about public good or are we talking about who came up with an idea first? And I think there are a lot of concepts that are instantiated in a way that are much more useful eventually by somebody else than the person that maybe originated the idea. What is the purpose of patents? I mean, is it to protect the person who had the original idea, whether they do something good with it or something that's publicly beneficial with it, or is it that we want to benefit the public with this this concept? I mean, what's... The theory behind the system is that in exchange for disclosing it to the world, you get the right to exclude others from practicing it for a limited period of time. 
So essentially, you get a monopoly to it for a limited period of time for teaching everybody else how wonderful it is. Regardless whether you do anything good with it or... Whether you practice it or not, correct. Correct. No. I think there... Oh, I, I, I owe you. <laughs> I think there's, getting close to nine o'clock. Yeah, no, there's a lot. Of, so first of all, there's a lot of like there's a lot of legal and philosophical debate over that question. So people are going to have slightly different answers. I think a better answer is what is did you need the monopoly protection in order to incentivize someone to make something that wouldn't have otherwise been made? I think there's a lot of good arguments that you know when people have to spend billions of dollars researching a drug. And does it actually cure this disease or not? And we had to try a bunch of things and da 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 da. There's maybe, I mean, pe this is controversial also in a different crowd, but there's, there's some reason to think that, you know, maybe without the patent system, that drug just would never have existed. And so maybe it's fair to say no one else can make it. So in, when we're talking about stuff like software, I think that's more unclear. Right? And so if you think the patent system is for encouraging the creation and dissemination of technologies that might not otherwise exist, then software is highly sus like a highly suspect thing but to so be the, What's really interesting about this, and just limited to the mobile phone context, there's this really good website called The Verge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's this guy who writes about patents for all the time. It's a great video. Uh, no, this is true. If you look at the mobile phone landscape, it, I hate to keep talking about slide but it's so easy. Um, yeah. Every manufacturer <laughs> first started out copying Slide Unlock. Apple has a patent on it, so they all said, fuck, like, we have to do something else. And there was this explosion of new UI ideas on how to unlock the phone. And I, last year, I was at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, like, last, like almost a year ago now. And we literally just walked around doing a video of how every phone unlocks. And they're all wildly different. And that's like a good thing, right? <coughs> Because they would have all just copied Apple. <laughs> but, okay. if but, but, but if they're less good go, to avoid Apple, then that's right. not that, better. Less good so is like getting, totally getting, subjective. I think we Some actually, of them are way better. We're all in agreement. We actually solved the debate. <laughs> um, so can I just get a final word from all the panelists? Just two minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll end. Um, so do you have a final word? Anything? You want to start on that end? OK, start on this end. <laughs> Well, I mean, I do think this has been mostly heated agreement. I think, the, 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 I mean, it's true. The, the problems are there, right? Like, they're, they're readily identifiable. And I think that the core issue is that structurally, we have to say software belongs in a different box. And we have to say what is software and what is the box. And we're, until we do those things, then our conversations about term length and uh, ability, like, you know, ability to cast a wide net, all these things, searching, which is, key, and until we say this is how you write a software patent, because this is what a software patent is, we're not going to move forward. And I think that's the fundamental issue. Craig? I see the fundamental issue as crappy patents. I mean, there's a tremendous number of embarrassingly bad patents that even go to a jury. It's really astonishing when you work, work in the industry. And there are good patents out there, and there are valuable patents out there, and that's, that's important to incentivize a lot of different things. But you have to have a way to knock out bad patents. And the system doesn't do an effective job of knocking out bad patents. Christopher, do you have a word or mean this? Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, it's been illuminating for me, certainly, as an observer. <laughs> and, and, and I think I agree uh, with your point that we haven't defined what software is. And just to get like a little matrixy for a second, if we, if we say that software patents are, uh, you know, a patent on uh, something that can run on a universal computer, which can simulate absolutely anything in the universe, then at, at that point, we can say, you know, software is something unto itself, and we can begin to sort of differentiate between the same way that we say that certain types of physical objects are patentable uh -huh. and not, you know, maybe everything that is below a certain threshold of simplicity that I don't know how you would measure is not patentable. <laughs> so slide to unlock, pull to refresh, all these uh, UI things, rounded corners, they're all not patentable. But if I come up with a, a, a radical new encryption algorithm and I don't want somebody to reverse engineer it and steal it from me tomorrow, and it took me a year or, or 10 to develop, that should be patentable. So then I would almost take software out of the equation and just say, what are, we act, what are the objects that we're trying to um, protect? Christina? Yeah. 
So I think Greg's totally right. There's a lot of bad patents out there. I think, though, that even if you solve that problem and all the patents were good, the search problem of just not being able to figure out what patents your product might be infringing is something that definitely needs to be fixed. And either it has to be not, you either have to be able to use, to have software patents or whatever the patents are, not be patentable, to have an independent invention defense, or to at least have whatever royalties you pay be fairly low so that it doesn't ruin your business. Um, my quick plug is in more detail with some math. Um, is a, I wrote a paper about this with Timothy Lee, who writes for Ars Technica, and it's on SSRN, and it's called Scaling the Patent System. So you can look it up if you want to read about anything I've talked about in sort of more detail, and uh, I would uh, appreciate it. Alan? Um, I would say we need to be careful about lumping all software patents together. Uh, I think there are certainly uh, patents that shouldn't have issued. Um, I would disagree with some of the other panelists on, on how many of those are out there. I think the system is better than, than um, we've given it credit for. But there are problematic ones. There are ones that are out there that shouldn't have issued. And there's, there's certainly some things that shouldn't be entitled to patent protection. And, and that's a, a debate we should have and perhaps some legislation to change uh, that, um, that, that the, the ability to get patents on some of these things. Or maybe a better job looking for ex pre-existing technology and better, more coherent arguments as to why certain things are not sufficiently different from existing technology to entitle them to uh, patents. But overall, I, I don't see a difference between software and other technology that we've historically uh, protected with the patent system, and it served this country very well. If you think about any of the important technology in the last 200 years, all of it was created here, or we had somebody creating it at the same time as it was being created somewhere else. Everything. Software is no exception in my mind. The other thing we haven't touched upon, I just would touch upon briefly here, is it's not just giving somebody a patent because they're first or protecting their investment. The ability to get a patent is what enables you to go get uh, venture capital money or angel investment money. Nobody's going to give you money if the next guy down can knock off your technology. So that's something that is um, in our system now and, and has to be recognized uh, and dealt with. So uh, that's where I stand on the, uh, the software patent debate. Uh, well, there are, there are a lot of sectors uh, in which IP doesn't play as prominent a role that are kind of, you know, flourishing important economic sectors, but bracketing that, I, I largely just want to say that I agree with everything Christina had to say and with her puzzled facial expression right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. This is the best panel I've ever been on for debating, because, like, we all talked, and I think the conversation moved and developed, and we responded to each other, so, like, thank you all, because I had the yeah. best time. So, yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.